Good evening, GPS. Thanks for joining us at this virtual town hall as we answer your questions about the opening of school and COVID. My name is Jonathan Sopranowitz, and I am the Board of Education Communications Liaison at Greenwich Public Schools. You have asked us lots of great questions over the past week, and we will do our best to answer as many of them in the next 60 minutes or so. We compiled and condensed similar questions to avoid repetition for the sake of time. At this session, only the cameras and microphones of our panelists will be active. We are recording this session for future viewing. It will be uploaded to our website and on our YouTube channel. I'm sure most of you are familiar with each of our five panelists, but for those that are new to the district and also to remind those that have been with us before, I'd like to tell you a little bit about them. Keep in mind, this is just a snapshot of their professional experiences. First, the superintendent of schools is Dr. Tony Jones. She has been with Greenwich Public Schools since 2019. Prior to coming here from 2006 to 2019, she was with the Fairfield Public Schools as a superintendent of schools. From 2011 to 2016, she was the superintendent at Falls Church City Public Schools. From 1998 to 2011, she was with the Deer Creek Public Schools as an elementary school principal, a middle school principal, a director of secondary education and technology, and chief academic officer. She has her doctorate in leadership from Oral Roberts University, a master's in reading from Charles Sturt University, and a Bachelor of Science in Special Education and Elementary Education from the University of Nevada, Reno. Dr. Ann Carabillo is our Deputy Superintendent. She's been with Greenwich Public Schools since 2016. She came to us from the Consolidated School District of New Britain, where she was there from 2000 to 2016. She was the Chief Academic Officer, a Director of Pupil Pupil Personnel Services, Director of Curriculum, Instruction, and Staff Development. She was a principal of the middle school and an assistant principal. She received her Doctor of Education from Central Connecticut State University and a Master's in Special Education. She has her Bachelor's in Music Education from the Hart School. Mark D'Amico is our Director of Curriculum and Leadership K-8. through He's been with Greenwich Public Schools since 2003. He was the principal of Glenville School and the assistant principal at Julian Curtis. He has a master's in elementary education, education from Sacred Heart University, a six-year degree in education leadership from Southern Connecticut State University, and a bachelor's in criminal justice from Pace University. Mary Keller is our supervisor of school health programs. She's been with Greenwich Public Schools since 2001. Prior to coming to GPS, she was at Columbia Presbyterian Morgan Stanley's Children's Hospital from 1980 through 1998. She was the Director of Pediatric Outreach and Head Nurse of Pediatric Oncology and Neonatal Intensive Care Units. She has her Master's of Public Health from Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health, a Bachelor of Nursing from Columbia University School of Nursing. Dr. Catherine Noble is our medical advisor. She's been a practicing pediatrician since 2003 and our medical advisor since March of 2020. She is the founding and managing partner of South Beach Pediatrics. She has a doctor of medicine from the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. She, uh, she did her residency at Boston College's hospital affiliated with Harvard Medical College. And she received her Bachelor of Art in Integrative Biology from the University of California, Berkeley by Beta Kappa. Before we get to your questions, we thought it would be good to show you the response we received regarding this town hall. As you can see, we received over 170 of your questions. A few words about our slides. 
If someone had multiple questions and multiple topics in one submission, we separated them. Sometimes we needed to edit down the question for space and time, but we believe we left the essence of the question intact. Now, let's get to our questions. Question one comes from Susan, who represents students at Greenwich High School and Eastern Middle School. Is school still on target to start on time on September 1? Dr. Jones, why don't you take that one? Absolutely, um, school is set on time uh, to begin on time. However, just a reminder, last year, uh, we are driven by state decisions, not only Connecticut State Department of um, Education, the Connecticut Department of Health, decisions by governor's executive orders. Um, so they can always make a change a week or two before school that could change that by a couple of days. But as of right now, we're anticip anticipating being on time. Our next question comes from Marie, representing a, a student at Riverside. What happens if there's an outbreak or positive case of COVID-19? Will cases be reported to parents? Absolutely. Dr. Jones? Yes, absolutely. Um, just as we did last year, we will continue to be as transparent as possible so that all of our families um, understand uh, what is happening with COVID, not only with individual notes that we will send um, to the schools, to the staff, but also with our COVID tracker again this year. Okay, thank you. Our next two questions. The first one comes from David at North Miami School and Janet at Greenwich High School. Is there science in masking our children? What is the ongoing emergency that the governor is using? Mandating masks for kids is detrimental to their physical and mental health. The second question is, what is the required mask mandate? Mary Keller, would you like to take this one? Please unmute yourself first. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Um, I can't speak directly for the governor, but I can share some information about um, what, what the science is behind our masking. Certainly the CDC has um, published a science brief that has more than 75 references for why masks work in protecting um, our children. Mandating masks um, is something that the governor does as part of his executive order, which brings me to question number two, which is his executive order uh, mandate is that all persons inside certain settings, which includes schools, must wear masks except for those who have mask exemptions signed by a physician. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. The next set of questions. Why does my child have to wear a mask if they are fully vaccinated? That comes from Zandi at Greenwich High School and Eastern Middle School. And the second question is why are masks not made an option? Why can't families make the choice that best fits their family? That comes from Jennifer at Eastern Middle in Old Greenwich. Mary, can you take that one again? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, we have our children wear these masks because great through infections do occur, and we still have asymptomatic carriers of infections. Although we're, we're hoping that at some point in time, this will change. Right now, in the best interest of all the children, we ask everyone to wear masks. Great, thank you, Mary. Mary, why don't you continue with the next one? It comes from Anthony, representing a child at North Mianus. What mask exemptions will be available for children? Mask exemptions are, are allowed for any medical condition that um, your physician and you decide is appropriate for our students um, based on a medical condition, a behavioral condition, a disability, or anyone under two years of age. We have on our website a form for mask exemptions that gets filled out after a discussion with you and your physician, and then we can honor those mask exemptions. Sometimes we look for alternatives. Sometimes we look at children with disabilities and try and um, take those into consideration for um, whether or not we're going to have a mask exemption. Great. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Our next question. 
comes from a Tratina at Costco School. Regarding the mask policy, is there a mandatory style, such as a high protective mask, N94 and 95? Are other forms permitted, such as a bandana? Uh, Dr. Jones, could you unmute your line and answer that question for us? Absolutely. Um, our board actually passed a policy um, last summer, which really helped guide with the type of masks which are acceptable. Um, the board at some point, it could be on the 23rd, which is when they meet to discuss back to school. Uh, we'll need to discuss that again. Uh, bandanas, gaiters, that type of masking is not um, does not meet uh, the Board of Education policy. It's actually a mask. Uh, which is of a certain quality, as well as the surgical mask, which we make available, uh, the blue surgical mask available at every school. We give a box to all of our teachers in their classrooms, um, and we provide those across the district. Great. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Leave your, um, your microphone unmuted because the next question is directed for you, too, from Doreen, who's representing students at Central Middle and Costco. If the governor does not require another mask mandate after September 30, will it be up to the parents, as it should be, whether their child or children wear a mask in class? I can't really speak to what will happen after September 30th. Um, you know, I think if, we, if we've learned anything over the last year and a half, every week can be different, every month can be different. And as we get closer to September 30th, we'll be evaluating that. The one thing that we have relied on heavily are our health professionals to help help us make those decisions about um, what will keep our schools and our children the safest. And we'll continue to do that. Um, and again, get guidance from not only the state, uh, from CDC, World Health Organization, the Pediatrics Association, um, our local health department, and then of course, Mary Keller and, and Dr. Noble who are represented here tonight. Fantastic. Our next question comes from Dana, representing a student at North Street School. Is it possible for children to remove their masks once they are at their desks as they will be spread out? Um, Mary, can you tackle that one for us, please? Sure. Um, the, there is no accommodation in the, in the governor's executive order, but we do allow for mask breaks during the day. So yes, um, they will be, they will be able to take their masks off, uh, during snack, when they're outside, during recess, perhaps even in gym class, but it is not an accommodation that when they come in and sit in the class that they're allowed to take it off once they're, once they're seated. Um, we hope as the number of cases decrease in the fall, if that's possible, and winter, we're hopeful that the DPH will revisit the, the mask use. Great. Thank you, Mary. The next question comes from Susan at Greenwich High School. It's impossible for kids with learning disabilities to stay focused wearing a mask after an hour. And doctors say that breathing CO2 from long mask wearing slows the brain. So why not ma mandate vaccines instead? Mary? Okay. We do not mandate vaccines as, as a district. That comes, I think it was spoken to before, that comes from the Department of Public Health and um, other agencies, the CDC. What we can do though is um, work with children with learning disabilities. We have alternatives for masking and we give special consideration for mask exemptions in those cases where behavioral issues um, are occurring. Thank you, Mary. The next question comes from Luciana at Old Greenwich School, and she asks, will the school provide masks to students if needed? Mary? Yes, um, I think Tony already alluded to this, that we have masks at every school and every teacher has um, masks that are available for the students. Great. Mary, let's continue with the next question as well. Kim from Old Greenwich School asks, will regular COVID testing be administered or required to catch mild asymptomatic cases to prevent spread in school? We are, we, it, it's not going to be required, but we are going to make it available. We are working very closely with the state um, to provide testing to those students 
uh, who are unvaccinated students, and I should say staff who are unvaccinated in grades K through six. Thank you, Mary. The next two questions. The first one is from Jen at Greenwich High School and Central Middle School. And she asks, what will GPS do to enforce social distancing and mask usage on the bus? And Rosemary from Greenwich High School asks, will the bus drivers allow windows to be open in moderate to good weather? And could you answer this one for us? Sure. So GPS to enforce social distancing, what they'll do is start off the way they did last year is that students at the bus stop will be waiting for the bus. When they see the bus pull up, they should have their masks on already. And then they will get on the bus and they will be sitting um, kitty corner to one another on the bus to, for social distancing. And if students are not wearing their masks or if they are not social distancing and they refuse to listen to the bus driver, the bus driver will report them immediately to the school administration as soon as they arrive. Bus drivers will be, open, will be allowed to open windows in moderate to good weather but it will be the bus drivers that would open the windows and they will be open probably at the very top. Great, thank you, Ann. Steph from Greenwich High School asks, will PTA volunteers be allowed in the building when school opens? And Carrie from Riverside School asks, will parents, PTA volunteers and external vendors, as an example, someone hired to lead an enrichment session, be permitted to enter school buildings this year. Dr. Jones, could you unmute yourself and answer that question for us? Sure. Um, one thing that we've been discussing as a leadership team is that we'll look a little bit more at the beginning of this year like we did at the end of last year, which means our key PTA volunteers will be allowed to come into building, help with things. Um, what we won't be able to do is have lots of people in classrooms. Um, as far as the external vendors, it really depends on the situation. If we have a vendor who travels all across the country doing different types of workshops, unless that workshop can be conducted outside where we really feel safe because they could have been in Texas or California the day before, um, it'll depend on the actual situation. And we work directly with the principals um, to determine the best steps forward on that. Great, thank you, Tony. Why don't you stay un unmuted because the next one's for you also from O at the Parkway School. Please describe parent options and the process that include homeschooling and opting out of in-person learning. It is very different this year um, than it was the last year and a half in that our legislature um, decided that remote learning was not going to be allowed. What we did last year for our K-5 uh, remote school would not be allowed this school year. So unless we have a governor's order or something of that nature, which we had in the spring of 2020, uh, that's not an option. It, when it comes to homeschooling, it basically is a matter of reaching out to the district office there is a form that parents must fill out about how they are going to provide education for their children. Um, and that form gets signed off and filed. But the, the thing I think that's most important for a family who really is thinking about homeschooling is that it does unenroll them completely from Greenwich Public Schools, although they do re still report to us. Um, I think I've answered that one, Jonathan. Great. Thank you, Dr. Jones. The next one's for you as well. Andrew from Greenwich High School and Central Middle School asks, in a May 12th email, Dr. Jones wrote that vaccination status is private and there is no obligation to disclose and not right to ask. Will Dr. Jones confirm that this is still district policy? I would say yes and no in that um, we, we look different from today from where we were last May. So last May, that email was really uh, more meant for a teacher in front of the classroom because we were all trying to figure this out. Should you be asking your children who's vaccinated in my classroom so that unvaccinated sit on one side and 
vaccinated on the other, that is not appropriate. However, this year we will be asking families within the next week or so uh, to actually email their school nurse and let us know if their children are in fact vaccinated and the same for staff and, it, and that is to the school nurse and that is because uh, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated makes a difference in the amount or the length of quarantine. Now certainly if a family chooses not to respond, that's their prerogative, uh, same way with a staff member. However, if they don't respond, they're assumed unvaccinated, which is the longer quarantine. Gotcha. Thank you, Dr. Jones. The next one's for you as well, it comes from Michael, Greenwich High School and Eastern Middle School. What is the Board of Education's policy requiring teacher vaccinations? We do not have um, a Board of Education policy requiring teacher vaccinations. And um, in the state of Connecticut, I think Mary, you alluded to this earlier, the Connecticut Department of Health has not recommended one way or the other and taken any action on mandating. Okay. Thank you. For the next two questions, Michelle at Glenville School said, asks, once vaccines are available for younger children, will it be mandated? What goes into this decision making? And Jen at Greenwich High School and Central Middle School asks, if COVID vaccine becomes available for kids less than 12 years of age, will GPS set up vaccine clinics to facilitate access to vaccinations? Mary? Thank you. Um, I think we, we talked around this a little bit already, but if vaccines become available for younger children, it is a decision made by um, the CDC, by the American Society for Immunization Practices, by the American Academy of Pediatrics. There's multiple organizations that go into it and make that decision. It's not a, a local decision for us. Now, if COVID vaccine becomes available for kids less than 12, I would anticipate that we're going to do the same um, partnership as we did successfully when we vaccinated the teachers and other students, that we will set up a partnership either with the state or with a local health center to vaccinate children, make it available to everyone who wants it. Great. Mary, be ready for the next two. The first one from Lisa at Eastern Middle School in Old Greenwich asks, will students that are vaccinated and unvaccinated be separated? And Luis at Greenwich High School and Eastern Middle School asks, will unvaccinated children and staff be required to test? The answer to, to both of those questions would be uh, no. Uh, students that are vaccinated and unvaccinated will use the same mitigation strategies that we've used successfully for the last year. Um, we will not be questioning students. We will know that in the nurse's office, but we will not be separating anyone um, based on their vaccination status. Um, will they be required to test? No, no one will be required to test, but we will have testing available for unvaccinated students in grade K through six, as well as staff. But that's something that um, is voluntary. It's not mandatory. Great, thank you, Mary. Our next question comes from Kristen, who represents students at Greenwich High School and Western Middle School. Are you going to be discriminating against students who are not vaccinated when it comes to playing sports? Mary? Uh, certainly not. We're not going to we're not going to um, discriminate against anyone. Um, as a nurse, I devote myself to making sure that I give the best care that I can to everyone, and everyone is treated equally. A medical professional should never discriminate against anyone. Students who are not not vaccinated not vaccinated will have the same opportunity to participate. The only difference would be if they're not vaccinated and there is an exposure, the quarantine for them would be a little bit longer. Mary, the next two questions are for you as well. Yeah. Katie at Greenwich High School in Parkway asked, what is the percentage of vaccination rates in Greenwich by age? And Sharon from Western Middle School asked, can GPS report on the percentage of staff and faculty that are vaccinated by school? Um, I think Jonathan is going to show um, a, 
copy of the front page of the data. Connecticut has a, a data portal that you can go to. They update it on Thursdays and can give you the number of cases in the town, cases in the state, and also vaccination rates by age. If you'll bear with me for just a second, I can briefly give you some numbers that I think are um, pretty impressive. Vaccination um, as of August 12th, last Thursday, for the age group 12 to 17, fully vaccinated were 77%. One dose was 88%. Age group 18 to 24, fully vaccinated was 76%. And one dose was 86%. Um, the age group 25 to 44, a little bit lower, fully vaccinated 64%, but not so bad and what received one dose, 70%. The 45 to 64 year old group, 79% were fully vaccinated, 84% had one dose. And the 65 and older were 89% fully vaccinated and 94% had at least one dose. And just anecdotally, I hear that vac vaccinations are surging across Connecticut. So I'll bet the numbers are even gonna be better next week. Great, thank you, Mary. Also, I'd like to add that the, the link to this page from the state of Connecticut is located on our webpage on the uh, COVID information section. Our next question comes from Lynn at Greenwich High School. What can parents sign to refuse forced vaccinations without parental consent? Mary? We, we don't have a form to sign that you can sign that refuses vaccinations, but the opposite, you must have an informed consent in order to get a vaccination. So no one will, will be vaccinating anyone unless there's an informed consent from a parent. And those students that are um, 15 to 18 years old, many of them have to have a parent with them when they get vaccinated. Great. Thank you, Mary. The next question comes from Vidya at Parkway High School. Can we choose to have a vaccinated teacher? What about the special teachers, music and art, et cetera? Uh, Tony, can you unmute yourself and answer that question? Yes, um, you can't choose just to be with a vaccinated or an unvaccinated teacher. And again, as a reminder, we are collecting that data from the nurse level, uh, but our staff are, you know, have the same rights as, as we would to our children. And uh, we are not allowed even to ask why uh, they're vaccinated or not vaccinated. Thank you, Tony. Our next question comes from Lindy at North Street School. After 18 months, the science and data are clear that this virus has virtually no effect on children and children are not a meaningful force driving the spread. Well, that's not a question, but if we can have some comments, maybe Dr. Noble, would you like to have something to say about that? I would. Um, I thank you so much for um, asking me to participate um, in this uh, discussion and I, I really understand the spirit behind this comment. And I will tell you in my own household with three teenagers, we've had some very lively conversations. Um, one of my children saying something very similar to this. Why do I need to get vaccinated or why do I need to wear a mask if this is really not a big deal for me if I became infected? And the reality is uh, most children who are infected with COVID tend to either have no symptoms at all or have mild infection. But nonetheless, there is that very small but very significant risk of life-threatening uh, complications from COVID that do exist in children. And very importantly, children do spread the infection. They spread it to one another. They spread it also to uh, teachers and potentially to other relatives who may be at risk. And this has actually been part of our discussion in our home as we've proceeded to make our family decisions. So, but I do very much understand um, the frustration, but I, I really still think this is something to be taken very seriously in children. Thank you, Dr. Noble. Our next set of questions 
Stacy from Greenwich High School asks, is there virtual learning when in quarantine? And Elizabeth at North Miami School asks, if an exposed student is required to quarantine, will they be taught remotely? If not, what's the plan so they don't fall behind? Dr. Jones? Um, thank you. So it looked very similar to how it did last year, especially when you look at that second question. Um, and you're talking about the K-5 environment where uh, children are, don't, we don't have a vaccine. So, you know, an exposure could impact numerous children. It's a little bit better this year than it was last year, uh, as far as the quarantine and how that will work. Um, but if they are sent home, they either have work in their Google Classroom, um, if it is a large quantity of the classroom and they're all going home together, um, then they're logging on to remote. And I'll just clarify, we cannot have a K-5 remote school. However, if we as a school district uh, for health reasons, send an entire classroom home, then they can log on and actually continue to teaching because it's a forced quarantine situation. Um, for six through 12, it's a little bit different. Um, we expect this year, so many of the students are vaccinated. It may be smaller numbers of children in quarantine and they will log in just like they did last year. I, I do think from the teacher perspective, it's gonna be very different and much better for the teachers because we had times last year, especially in high school, where teachers were trying to teach dual, students in the class and students at home, but they would actually have four students live in the classroom, which is a really unusual environment for a live classroom, and you might have 20 at home. This year, it would be totally opposite. It would be because students can't just choose to stay home and be on virtual. Uh, they will need to be present or they would be counted absent. And so those students at home are just going to be those who are in quarantine. So I think it's gonna be a much improved environment over what we had last year. Dr. Jones, the next two questions are for you as well. Jilly from Greenwich High School, Central Middle School and North Street asks, will there be any hybrid learning options? While Adriana at North Miami School asks, why are we not given the option for remote school? So, you know, again, I'll repeat a little bit of what I said and add to that, um, but it's really, it was legislated. Um, and it really has to do with the data across Connecticut, not Greenwich. We were one of the school districts, um, and I, with, I want to, with Mark on my screen, much credit to him who really helped lead uh, our K-5 remote school. Um, we had a really successful K-5 remote school. They performed well. There was a high level of learning, but a lot of districts across um, the state were not in that same situation. And they were doing workbooks at home and students were disengaged. And it's become a, a real concern. And it's really not even only in Connecticut, it's across the country. So they really, in the state of Connecticut, have said, we want everybody in person. And the only time you're going to be offered remote is if it's like a school forced quarantine or a medical issue. So that's really where we are as of today. As far as the hybrid, uh, the only place we had a hybrid last year was in the high school. And again, that involved um, part face-to-face -face and part uh, you know, remote where they were doing the two different cohorts. And that is not allowed um, this year. And we don't think that would be best for our students. I might add that. We, we, we would like everybody back. Great. Thank you, Dr. Jones. The next question is for you as well from Adam over at Greenwich High School and Eastern Middle School. Will there be snow days this year or will remote be an option if there is inclement weather? Uh, this is one of those questions that I'm really hopeful that at the state level, they'll do some reevaluation because I can see on the first day we have a snow day, letting our kids go out and just play and be you know, young people and children and sledding. But if we have a week where we are out of school, you know, I hope that we don't lose the really good aspects that we learned about COVID because we can do remote learning really, really well. And I hope that they will reevaluate this and allow us, if we're going to be out of school for a week, let's get kids back in school on day two and three and let those days count um, for remote snow days. But as of right now, the way it stands today, that would not be allowed. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Our next question comes from Bing representing a child at Eastern Middle School asks, when a student tests positive, how do you define who has close contact with the person and who needs to be quarantined? Uh, Mary, would you like to take that one? Sure. Um, 
the CDC and the State Department of Public Health make those determinations and guide us, but I can walk you through. This has changed a little bit from last year. If exposed in the classroom and there's stationary seat seating, in other words, um, probably second grade and beyond, at um, greater than three feet and everyone is wearing a mask, then no there is no quarantine for those students because they're not considered exposed. If they are less than three feet, they'll need to quarantine for seven days, test on day five or later, have a negative test, no symptoms, and return on day eight. All others, not classroom students, um, will need to be more than six feet with or without a mask, or I'm sorry, less than six feet with or without a mask, will need to quarantine for seven days, test on day five or later, have a negative test and return on day eight. If you choose not to test, the quarantine lasts for 10 days. The quarantine for vaccinated students is your, is your exposure is less than three feet or six feet for non-students, with or without a mask, no quarantine is needed, but a test will be required on day three, four, and five, and you'll need to wear a mask for 14 days post-exposure. I know that's that's a lot. Maybe we could leave that slide up for another minute. Um, if, if I can just make a, a quick comment here for those children who have been vaccinated, who are frustrated by the fact that they still face restrictions, I think this is an important point that there is no quarantine if you are fully vaccinated, just a need to test. And that is an advantage. And that is something to, I think, be happy about. Um, and hopefully this will remain in place. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that that point was made clear. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Dr. Noble. I think we'll probably post these guidelines also on our website so everyone can grab them. Our next question comes from Jennifer, who represents a child at Costco School. Will there be required quarantine for out-of-state travel by car or plane during the school year? Mary? Okay, this is uh, this question, uh, again, goes to vaccinated or unvaccinated. Um, if you are vaccinated, you need to test on day, between day three and five but no quarantine is necessary. This is for domestic travel. If you are unvaccinated, you need to test between day three and five and quarantine for seven days returning on day eight. So it's a full seven day quarantine. International travel is a little bit different. For unvaccinated and vaccinated, you must test before you get on the plane to return. Um, you must test if you are unvaccinated on day three and five, and quarantine for seven days. If you're vaccinated, again, test before you get on the plane, test on day three, five, three to five, but no quarantine is necessary there either. Thank you, Mary. I also wanted to point out that the CDC has uh, a webpage dedicated to, to travel during COVID, and that link will be up on our website as well. Our next two questions, Bren from Greenwich High School asks, if there is exposure to COVID in a classroom, how will contact tracing work? Will vaccinated students have to quarantine? And Elizabeth at Greenwich High School and Central Middle School asks, what will the quarantine rules be for vaccinated students with COVID exposure in or out of school? Mary? Okay. Um this, is, this again goes to the classroom setting. What CDC has said and what they base their data on for the three foot rule is only for students. It is not for anyone else. It's not for outside of a classroom. It's not for a teacher. It's only for students that are sitting stationary in a classroom. So we would look at those students who were less than three feet in a stationary setting um, wearing masks at, or without masks. And if those students were less than three feet, they would, if unvaccinated, be sent home. But that's going to result in um, much fewer students being sent home in some of the elementary classes than we had seen in previous years. But 
but someone else outside of the outside of the school or anywhere else not sitting seated in a classroom where you will go back to the six foot quarantine um, you know distance. If you were less than six feet, you would still need to quarantine if it was outside of those very limited parameters in the classroom. You know, Mary, last year, we always got a lot of questions about our contact tracing procedures. Mm -hmm. Can you give them a little, just a quick little overview on how that actually works? With lots of questions, I'm always impressed how you get that job done. <laughs> Can you tell everyone how it gets done? Well, we start with looking at the seating charts, who's in the classroom. We then ask the teacher to identify um, who was seated around that, that student. We then ask who else was in the classroom. Was there a para? Was there someone, a music teacher who came in? Was there a theater um, person who came in or a media person who came in? We ask about recess. We ask about who sat with that person at lunch. We ask who they walk home with, who's their best friend. We ask um, a lot of questions. We make sure we know whether they, whether or not they were wearing a mask. Um, and then we determine um, this year we will be able to ask um, in the older grades, you know, who's been vaccinated and be able to determine whether they are going to be required. But we certainly review every every possible contact this person um, can, comes in contact with during the school day and try to determine who had an exposure for more than 15 minutes in a 24 hour period um, last year at less than six feet. And this year it will be three feet in the classroom. Do you do that all yourself? No, all of my nurses do that. We all take turns doing that. The, the nurses in the various schools are wonderful. They work nights and weekends um, to do all this contact tracing. And they, they are a great team, but they know their students, they know their teachers, and it, it works well. We're a good team. Great, thank you, Mary. Our next question comes from Alicia at Western Middle in Glenville. Should the precautions be more stringent in the elementary schools than the middle and high schools? Mary? Um, we're hoping that the vaccine gets approved for children under the age of 12 soon. But until then, it is best to keep our students as safe as possible, regardless of the age, regardless of um, what school they're going to. We use the same mitigation strategies in all of the schools, masking, distance, ventilation, um, disinfectant, um, it worked very successfully last year, and we will keep that. We will keep that up. Great, thank you, Mary. Our next question comes from Thomas at Greenwich High School. How will cohorting work if all students are returning to school? And can you take this one for us? Sure. Um, actually, because all the students will be back, there will not be any cohorting per se, because we can't do any kind of a remote or a hybrid uh, a high school schedule this year. However, students will be social distancing. They'll follow the same traffic patterns as they did last year. They will all be three feet apart in the classrooms. They'll be wearing their masks. The lunch, will, lunch room student center will look the same as it did at the end of last year, if any parents were able to see it. It's a mixture of tables with plexiglass and chairs and desks, so students are separated and that they will have distance as they are eating their lunch. So we are hoping that as we move forward, uh, this, the administrators are still thinking about how they're going to have students come in and um, what they're going to do with having doors open or doors closed at 8.30, open and then closed at 8.30. So they're still working on that this week. Great, thank you, Ann. Stay unmuted because the next question comes to you from Gina at Greenwich High School. Will there be regular cafeteria services this year or should we expect to go back to a grab and go bagged lunch system? We are going to be doing both. There will be grab and go. There will be one hot um, 
menu item per day. And we hope to grow on that at, at the high school in the Cardinal Cafe, but we have to go slowly to see what happens with our mitigation strategies and keeping kids safely distanced as they are going into the Cardinal Cafe. Thank you, Anne. For the next two questions, Lauren from Costco School asks, will GPS continue lunchtime as last year to ensure that there is at least three feet between kids when eating? And Sarah at Costco asks, how will lunch and snack time be organized? Mark, can you answer these questions for us? Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Lauren and Sarah, thank you for your questions. Lunch is going to look exactly the way it did last year. Um, it will look a little bit different at each school, dependent on the square footage of their cafeteria, um, the size of their tables, the shapes of their tables. So there very well may still be uh, an auxiliary cafeteria in many of our buildings so that we can safely socially distance students. Uh, we will stagger lunch waves so that there's ample time for cleaning snack whenever the weather is good we're going to continue to encourage teachers to take students out not only does it give them an opportunity to have a mask break but it's nice to have snack outside uh, if we do have to have snack indoors their uh, their clear dividers will be up and one thing that we did last year was we staggered the rows for when students had snacks to give an extra um, an extra few feet uh, buffer between students thank you for your question Thank you, Mark. Our next two questions. The first one comes from Roseanne at Greenwich High School. Have you considered upgrades to heating, ventilation, and air conditioning at GHS to support mitigation of indoor air quality as it relates to COVID transmission? While Janet at, Gre at Glenville School asks, what increased ventilation efforts are being made? Dr. Jones? Thank you, Jonathan. Um, we actually worked on this not only last year, but the high school, even before last year, had a brand new cooling tower. All of their system was set. They actually have a very good system at the high school. Um, we are set, and we had the you know officials do this for us, the experts, where we bring in fresh air in the morning, and it pulls that air into the school and two hours before school starts. And then at the end of the day, um, we pull that back out two hours into the evening, and then that cycle starts over again the next day to make sure we're bringing in ample fresh air inside the building. And that is that is what was recommended by uh, leading epidemiologists and everybody who has really studied um, this issue. They, they were very specific this year in their guidance, which came out from probably about a month ago, month and a half ago, that we really wanna do everything we can to get windows open, uh, where windows do open, that that is actually the preferred method over um, mechanical systems or things or units that you would just place in a room. So we are continuing um, to, to do that. Last year, we brought a contractor out who worked on uh, several of the windows around the district to make sure some of our older windows that we really hadn't opened can now open. So we're in pretty good shape um, because we did all of that work last year. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Larry, representing a student at North Miami School. He asked, can water fountains be made available to refill water bottles? Dr. Jones? Absolutely, and we had several buildings last year where we added fillers, and uh, I know Mark's gonna write this down for me. We'll make a note since North Mianus is our tricky building. Uh, it could have been with everything happening in North Mianus that uh, they lost a water fountain or something um, when their ceiling fell. So we'll check on those refillers um, at North Mianus specifically. Great. Our next question comes from JG at Eastern Middle School. Are there functioning air conditioning in all of the middle schools, Dr. Jones? As far as having air conditioning, yes. Different types of air conditioning, though, depending on the building, depending on where you are in the buildings, um, but they are able to have air conditioning, yes. Great. Our next question comes from Liz at Hamilton Avenue School. Will the after-school program be available to students for this school year? Mark? Liz, thank you for your question. We understand how important it is uh, to have before and after-school childcare available to our families. 
each school is looking at their options for moving forward where possible. And we'll certainly communicate out with their respective families as soon as possible. But it is our intent uh, to provide those services where we can. Our next question comes from Liz in North Miami School. Will students be able to use the playground equipment at recess? Mary? Uh, yes, they will be. Um, we're learning more and more about this virus every day. And the CDC, uh, perhaps a month or so ago, came out with new data that says, you know, from surface, surfaces are not as contagious as once thought. And just routine cleaning is, is mostly all we need to do. And just high touch areas, maybe areas where we need to do a little more cleaning, but for the most part, recess and playground equipment is fine. Our next question comes from Sarah at the Hamilton Avenue School. There was a concerning amount of student time spent on screens last year in school and at home. Will you be, will you be reducing screen time and going back to more pencil and paperwork. Mark, can you tackle this one for us? Sarah, thank you for your question. Our goal is always to look for balance in everything that we do. So we will certainly be looking and being mindful of the screen time for students across our district this school year. And we look forward to getting back to more of our hands-on approach to teaching and learning. Mark, stay unmuted because the next question is going to go to you as well. Danny from Central Middle and Costco asks, how are we accounting for the disruption and learning loss when students return to the classroom, many for the first time in 18 months? How are we planning to get students in the right place and on track? Great question, Danny. It's a question we're asked often. Our administrators have spent a great deal of time this summer analyzing spring performance data. Each school data team will identify specific paths for intervention as appropriate for each individual child. I cannot stress this enough, however, if you have concerns about your individual child, please communicate early and often with your school so that we can work in partnership. I think it's also important to note we've increased math intervention this in all of our buildings. And we've added social workers at the elementary level to handle and address any social emotional learning needs. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Lauren, representing a student at Costco School. Will dividers be used in the classroom to protect the children, especially in classes with 20 plus students? Mark? Thanks, Lauren, for the question, and it's a short answer, yes. Our next question comes from Matthew, representing a child at Greenwich High School. Why were COVID death shields discarded last June? Will the district now have to purchase shields again? Tony? So we kept all of the very hard plexiglass uh, which are the dividers that they're really quite expensive. The only ones that we threw out were the ones that, and you tend to see them out in K5 on all of the desks. We had some in middle and some in high, um, but they also get very dirty. And especially the ones that were at elementary where they were having snacks behind them. So you open your juice and it sprays on, <laughs> sprays on the divider. And so when we looked at them at the end of the year, it would have cost us more to try to actually clean them where we felt that it was we were comfortable to give them to another child than just to purchase new ones. Um, so we did use some of our uh, federal funding just to have a new order so that everybody has a nice clean one to start the year. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Alex representing a student at Riverside School. Will there be cohorting in the advanced learning program at K-5 schools? Mark? Thank you, Alex, for the question. Cohorting won't look the same as it did last year because we did that out of necessity to keep our class sizes as low as possible. But what is exciting about this year is we do have uh, two 90 minute advanced learning program blocks. We have a STEM block and we have a humanities block. 
So in total, that's 180 minutes. So this will minimize transitions to and from the general ed classroom for our advanced learners. Great. Our next question comes from Alex, but at North Miami School. Alex asks, will there be an opportunity for non-kindergarten elementary students, for non-kindergarten elementary students who are new to a school to meet their teacher or get a tour of the school? If not in person, then perhaps via Zoom. Mark? Thank you, Alex, for the question. We certainly wanna make sure our schools are inviting, not only for our kindergartners and our new students, but for everyone who's coming back to school this fall. Uh, we are eyeing Friday for the day where we send out our class list at the elementary school. And in that will be back to school uh, information from your child's principal. Uh, we are still fine tuning exactly what the uh, day before school orientation or meet and greet will look like, but we are certainly being thoughtful of the fact that children and families are anxious to reunite with the school. So uh, I look forward to uh, seeing the creative and wonderful ways our principals are able to do that in a safe manner. Great, thank you, Mark. Our final question of the evening comes from Patricia over at Greenwich High School. Last year, the choral program was severely impacted by COVID restrictions. Will students be able to sing this year? Anne? Well, I'm very happy to say yes, students will be able to sing this year. However, there will be mitigation strategies in place. All students will wear a mask. They have to be six feet apart and they have to face in the same direction. Everybody faces the same direction. And we are hoping that students will be in a place where there is really good ventilation. At the high school, our choral rooms and music rooms happen to be very big. In our middle schools, we have auditoriums that can be used for choral uh, practice. And they should not sing any longer than 30 minutes. So we are looking forward to bringing back our choral program and our brass and woodwind programs and our strings programs. Fantastic, thank you, Anne. Well, this concludes our virtual town hall meeting. I want you to know that we answered 57 questions this evening. That's a large stack of questions. Thank you for all those that submitted. Please know that even if we didn't answer your personal question at this presentation, each submission was read by us. Please use your usual channels for additional questions and feedback by contacting your principal or administrator. Thank you to our five panelists for their participation as well. Have a great night. Thank you.